got angry and maybe it even skewed your perspective and you said something that you regretted later on. It reminds me of an article I came across. Uh, it was from 2009. It was about a 27-year-old woman in Florida who went into a McDonald's and, and ordered a 10-piece um, uh, chicken McNugget meal, uh, only to have the cashier inform her that they ran out of McNuggets. And she got so angry and upset and contentious with this cashier that she picked up the phone and called 911. Not once, but three times. And all she got for her anger was the police showing up and giving her a ticket. She was this close to getting arrested. Why? Because anger has this unique ability, doesn't it, church, to skew our perspectives and to twist our judgment if we don't know how to conquer anger. We talked about the dynamic of, of how to control our anger uh, and the importance of conquering it last week, and we've got a part two to that this morning. Here's what the research is telling us uh, currently about anger. The average woman loses her temper on an average of three times a week. But men, your average is double that, six times a week. Ladies, that was your opportunity. <laughs> Women get more often angry with people while men get angry at stuff, machines, things that break, things that don't work, as we saw in our video this morning. Single adults express anger twice as often as married individuals. Men are far more physical in their anger than women and are more likely to express anger at home than anywhere else. That should not surprise us. They say that successful marriages are now uh, not those marriages where anger or conflict does not exist, but where it has been learned to, uh, where it is uh, being managed properly, where the couples have learned to manage and to express that anger in a constructive way rather than a destructive way. So as we continue in our intrepid series we've been in, as we launched into our new year, I've got a word for you about conquering your anger. The courage to conquer your anger is found right here in the scripture. And we're going to go back to the passage we looked at in Ephesians chapter 4. And I want to begin reading in verse 25. If you have your iPhone, iPad, a scripture, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 25, the scripture says, Therefore, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is saying, Put away lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to to the devil. And as we pointed out last week, it's important to understand the context of this passage that whenever we allow our anger to, to get the best of us or we are not managing and controlling it properly, the scripture says that we are opening up a door for Satan, for the adversary to come in and to get the upper hand in our lives. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good that he may have something to give to him who has need, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Notice the context. Not only do we open up a door to the adversary, but we actually grieve and we push away the Holy Spirit working in us and around us when our anger gets out of control. He said, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. Last week we said God has given to us in this passage a set of revolutionary principles for helping us to, to conquer our anger and to make it our friend rather than our enemy, rather than our foe in life. And last week we looked at the first two principles that, that are given to us in the scripture and we said number one what's important to understand about how to conquer courageously anger we need to first of all admit number one that we're angry. We need to own the fact that we've got 
anger because many people in our culture, many Christians in the church are living in denial when it comes to this powerful emotion. Number two, we said not only do we have to learn to admit that we're angry and get in touch with our anger, but number two, we have to understand the dynamic of how our anger works. And we look particularly at verse 26. The paradox of this passage really is profound for us because on one hand, God says, I want you to be angry, but do not sin. How many of you know that there's a tension in that paradox for us? God said it's okay to be angry. And as we saw back in Genesis chapter 1, actually anger was a part of the aggression that God gave to to Adam and subsequently Eve to to have dominion over the earth and to, to conquer and to create and to build and to expand. It was part of the the equipment that God gave to them. But through the fall, that equipment, like all of our equipment, emotionally, got marred and got damaged. And we're learning how, through the redemptive work of Christ at Calvary, for God to come and to sanctify all of our emotions, including this thing we call angry, our anger. I want you to notice that there's really two parts in verse 26 that is important for us to grasp. Uh, The first part, when he says, Be angry. God's giving us permission to not only have that emotion, but to express it. That part we said last week is involuntary. We don't have control over that. Einstein discovered that you can destroy matter, but you cannot destroy energy. Energy can only be redirected. Anger is energy. When you get angry as a person, for whatever reason... There is a biochemical reaction that happens in the body that produces energy. There's a, an emotional reaction that produces energy. That energy has to go somewhere, and it's involuntary. Then on the other hand, he says, what you do with that anger is of the utmost importance because he said, I, I do not want you to sin with that energy. The first one is involuntary. The second one is voluntary. So, of course, this past year, many were saddened and grieved at the death of Whitney Houston. And, you know, there were people just raging on the Internet and on Facebook, making comments, blaming Bobby Brown and and others for her death. Uh, And yet, if you go back to her 2002 interview with Diane Sawyer, it's, it's interesting to hear her talk about the issues that brought her to the place uh, that she found herself last year. And in the interview, she said, I don't want you to blame anybody for what's happening in my life. She said, what what has happened to me is mine and mine alone. I have have the, the power to choose to decide for myself what I want to do. And the decisions that I have made, I own those decisions. It's not Bobby Brown's fault. It's not somebody else's fault. It's My decision, it's my choice. And church, that's true for you and I when it comes to all of the emotional issues that we deal with in our life, especially this thing we call anger. The choices we make with that energy, how many of you know that we have to live with those choices? Be angry, God said, but don't sin. And in order to fulfill that tremendous mandate in that challenge, we've got to, number three, learn how to control our anger. That's where I want to really begin this morning. One of the most effective ways of doing that is just to remind yourself of the consequences of anger gone awry. Listen to some of the scriptures. I just want to highlight these for you. Proverbs 29, verse 22. How many of you love the book of Proverbs? It's the book of wisdom to guide us. And the Bible says that that the book of Proverbs and the, the way of wisdom... Uh, directs us into paths of peace and pleasantness where we find the blessing of God. Proverbs 29, 22 says, a hot-tempered man gets in all kinds of trouble. Proverbs 15, 18 says, hot tempers cause arguments. Proverbs 14, 29, anger causes mistakes. Proverbs 14, 17, people with hot tempers do foolish things. So Jesus gathers his disciples in Matthew chapter 5 and in the Sermon on the Mount he says, I want you to understand that when you are angry with somebody without a cause, you, you stand to be judged. If you call somebody a worthless idiot, 
He says, you could find yourself before the council. If you curse your brother, you are threatened by hell itself. Now, I understand that's contextual. There's a cultural context there. But here's the, here's the transferable principle. Here's the universal principle that's profound for you and I. The less control we have in our lives, how many of you know the greater the consequences? I think you miss that. The less control, Jesus was saying, the greater the consequences. And that is true whether you are a turtle. Remember we talked about the turtle illustration last week that when you have confrontation and you're angry, the turtles have a tendency to pull in, to turn in, and for that anger to go underground, the passive aggressives. But then we've got, on the other hand, the skunks. It's true for the skunks as well. Those are the aggressive people who just put it out there. They spew it. They stink the whole place up, don't they? They have to get it out right now, no matter where we are at that moment. And it's true for both. The less control, the greater the circumstances. And we talked about Alexander the Great last week, how uh, in that moment of a fit of rage with his longtime friend from childhood, one of his generals, Cletus, in that moment when they were, they were banqueting together and, and, and partying and they began to taunt and tease one another that Alexander became offended, picked up a spear and threw it at his friend and, and instantly killed a man that he loved dearly. History tells us that he wept for days, tried to commit suicide. And here is a man who conquered nations, yet did not have rule over his own spirit, his own emotions. And there's a word we use to describe what happened to Alexander in that moment. It's the word escalation. Anybody here escalated before? Thank you for the three people that were honest. <laughs> Number one, you have to admit you're angry. <laughs> Thank you. We got two or three more hands. We're getting there. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough thing to come to terms with. The opposite of escalation, I don't know if you realize this, is self-control. Say that with me this morning. Self-control. One of the key revelations and the key principles that is being given to us by the great apostle as he was moved by the Holy Spirit is to understand that to conquer anger, we must grow in the fruit of the Spirit. We call self-control. Galatians chapter 5, Paul makes it this tremendous comparison between the works of the flesh which, which destroy and bring conflict and confusion versus the fruit of the Spirit, which is born of the Spirit, getting a hold of our lives and working from the inside out of us. And he says in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Amen? James 1, 19 and 20, he says, My beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not Produce the righteousness of God. See, there's two kinds of anger. There's a godly anger and there's an ungodly anger. One is born of the spirit. One is born of the flesh. Both have tremendous energy and have to be controlled and ultimately directed. Because that energy has to go somewhere. That's number four. We have to learn how to direct it. So we go back to verse 26. Be angry and God says, sin not. God didn't say, I want you to suppress it, repress it, or just express it. He said, I want you to direct it. That's really what God is driving at. Get a hold of it, control it, and then direct it. With God's help through the work of the cross, we can transform that energy from any enemy to ally, master to servant. And church, I'm here to tell you, there are some things in life that we need to be angry about. And God gives us permission to be angry about. Aristotle said anyone can be angry, that's easy, but to be angry with the right person, to the right degree, at the right time, for the right purpose, and in the right way, that's not easy. See, the problem's not anger. The problem is whether it's appropriately or inappropriately being expressed. Church, 
Directed anger is a good thing. It produces great marriages, great leadership, great friendships, great churches, great businesses, and great dreams. Amen? So how do we direct our anger? By practicing what I like to refer to as anger for good. Say that with me this morning. Anger for good. Church, anger can be your friend if you focus and direct it towards things that are good and that glorify God. Anger can be creative. It can be powerful. It can be strategic. It can be motivational. It can be productive. It can be the thing that drives you to fight. Why? Because there is no good thing in your life. There is no dream. There is no destiny that you will ever fulfill without a fight. Paul said coming to the end of his life, Timothy, in his farewell address, I fought a good fight. Why? Because Paul understood he was taking territory back that the enemy had stolen. Some of you have come here this morning and you have been robbed. You have been misled. You have given up territory because of wrong choices in your life. And through the redemptive work of Christ, God wants you to take that territory back and then some. But in order to do that, you've got to be willing to fight the good fight of faith. You have to know what to fight for, where to direct your focus, when to draw the battle line. You have to know where to put your emphasis and when it's time to take a stand and when it's time to allow things to just just to slide off of you and roll off of you because it really doesn't amount to a whole lot of anything. There are too many Christians in the church that are making mountains out of molehills. And they're, they're majoring on the minors when they need to be majoring on the majors and focusing on the things that are worth fighting for. Today, there are things that you and I, we need to be fighting against. We need to be fighting against sin. The sin that so easily entangles us, ensnares us, besets us. We need to be fighting against injustice, misfortune, poverty, sickness. That's what drove and motivated Mother Teresa. When one of her students who she was training said to, to, to Mother Teresa, I want to see Jesus. In a bit of a harsh response, she said, I'll show you Jesus. You come with me into the to the city and to the streets of Calcutta. And I will show you the face of Jesus and the poor and the sick and the dying laying in the street. She said, you want to see Jesus? Come with me. There's things that we need to be fighting for that are good, that are right, that are holy. At the end of Samson's life, after making some terrible mistakes that cost him his eyesight and, 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 and a good part of his future, as they brought him out the Philistines to taunt him, to humiliate him as they worshiped their false heathen gods. And they made fun of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as he stood between those two pillars, changed, chained in humility. He called upon the Lord with a broken heart in a contrite spirit, and said, God, just one time, give me one more chance, one more opportunity to do the right thing. He was so angry, so infuriated, so incensed, not only by his own sin, but by the sin of the heathen who taunted who he knew was the true and the living God. And God gave Samson his strength back, for his strength was in his hair, and they had cut his hair after he disclosed the secret. That which was proprietary between him and God had been exposed. And in that moment, God answered his prayer, and, and just like it was nothing, he took those pillars, and he ripped them out of the ground, and he swung those pillars, and the entire building collapsed, killing all of the Philistines bringing God glory. What do we call that church? We call that anger for good. He was willing to fight for that which was good and right and holy in spite of himself and his own failures and shortcomings and mistakes. 
When anger is directed properly, it can motivate you and I to fight for our dreams. Just like Jacob fought for his dream. For 20 years, Jacob made him his slave. Why? Because he wanted Jacob's daughter, Rachel. He was smitten. He was in love. He wanted that woman. For 20 years, Jacob used him, abused him, lied to him, stole from him. But he would not be denied. And God not only rewarded his faithfulness, but blessed him greatly by not only giving him Rachel, but promoting him in incredible ways in the future. Why? Because he was fighting for his dream. You've got a dream. And if you think that dream is ever going to become a reality without a fight, you are dreaming. You're in fantasy land. The reality is is that that which is good, that which is of God, that which is is beneficial to others, that will promote it, it is going to be a fight, and you have to be willing to fight for it. Fight for your family. Fight for the things that are important to God. That's what Charles Colson did. If you remember two of the the predominant characters in the Watergate scandal, Charles Colson and John Ehrlichman were both arrested, put in jail. They sat in the White House in the Oval Office with the president. They found themselves in jail. Charles Colson became a Christian. John Ehrlichman became a Christian scientist. One found forgiveness. The other one became angry and bitter. When they were released, Charles Colson founded the largest prison ministry in the history of the United States of America, Prison Fellowship. He went home to be with the Lord this past year. John Ehrlichman, for a good part of his time after he was released, he criticized, attacked, wrote scathing Reviews of Charles Colson. When Charles Colson found out that Ehrlichman had been diagnosed with an incurable disease and his wife, his third wife, had abandoned him, his kids would have nothing to do with him and he was left alone, guess who showed up to visit? John Ehrlichman. Charles Colson. He shared the love of Christ, talked about forgiveness. Ehrlichman was so profoundly impacted by that visit by a man that he used, abused, talked about, defamed. When the doctors told him he had three months to live, guess who he called for? Charles Colson. Unfortunately, he was not available because he too had become sick. So Colson sent a friend of his who visited John Ehrlichman and led him to Christ and church the anger The seething anger was transformed, they tell us, into love and joy and peace. Why? Because there is a transformational dimension when you bring God into the equation. It's it's not only about admitting our anger and understanding our anger and controlling our anger and directing our anger, but I'm here to tell you it is about understanding the transformational power of Christ in the human heart. How do you put away wrath and anger and bitterness when it's consuming you on the inside? You invite the master of your heart, and he will touch. And in a moment's time, when you humble yourself and you invite him to come in and you open up the door, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man opens up, I will come in and we will will have fellowship together together. We are going to have a relationship. You are going to find forgiveness and eternal life. And when you open up the door of your heart, in that moment, he begins to transform all of the broken emotions. Some of you, your biggest challenge in life is the brokenness of your past, the broken emotions. If you will give that anger to him by, first of all, committing your life to him, you will see him do amazing things on your behalf. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you're here this morning and you've never taken the step to open up the door, today you are not here by chance. He's knocking on the door of your heart. And if you'll open up and say yes to him, yes, I need God in my life. I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I want to cross over the line and, and confess you as my Lord and Savior. 
it will be change. It'll be change. It'll be transformation for you. And you'll leave here with the assurance of your salvation, knowing, and there are many of you watching online, some who may listen to this CD. You don't have this connection by chance. It's because God knew that you'd be here today. He knew that you'd be listening. If you need to take that step to surrender your heart to Christ and open up the door, you cannot earn God's favor. You cannot earn your way into heaven. You cannot buy his forgiveness by going to church, taking communion, being baptized. Those are all things that express the fact that you have already done that in your heart. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, he said. In Ephesians chapter 2, the apostle Paul, lest any man, woman, or child will ever be able to boast. God, I'm here because I did these things and the good outweighed the bad. That'll never happen. How many of you know that we all hang in the balance? We are all found wanting. But when you open up the door as he knocks on your heart and you say, God, I need you in my life. I need your forgiveness. God will transform and make that anger your friend and your ally. How many of you would say, I need God in my life? Put your hand up real high. Thank you, thank you. Hands going across, up across the sanctuary. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Some of you listening online, you need to open up the door. He's knocking on your heart. And if you want to do that this morning, I'm going to pray what we call a responsive prayer. I'm going to ask you to do it with me as a congregation. I'm going to ask those of you listening online to do it with me as well as those of you who raised your hand. You pray this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I take a step of faith today to open up my heart as you came to me and laid your life down for me, I open my heart to you and I invite you to come in to be my Lord and, and my Savior. I believe you died on the cross for my sin and on the third day you rose from the dead that I might have life and have it more abundantly. Lord Jesus, I want that peace. I want that joy. I want my anger to be directed for good. Help me to do that today as I surrender my heart to you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Let's congratulate those who did that for the first time. That is the greatest miracle that you could ever experience, to be born again into God's kingdom to get right with him. And if this was your last day on planet Earth, you can know that you know that you know that heaven is your home, that you're right with him. Why? Because he did it for you and I. We call this the great exchange. He takes our unrighteousness and he gives us his righteousness, his right standing with the Father. I'm so glad that you came this morning. If this was your first time to make a commitment to Christ, it is so important that you get into a good church because I want to tell you something. You've made a connection to God and God's made a connection to you. And the devil, he hates that. He will fight you. He will give you every reason not to come back to church, not to get involved in a community. And it's the very lifeline that you need. It's the very thing you need to get connected. Not only on Sunday morning, we got spheres groups that meet, classes throughout the week. You've got to get connected to a class. You need to start reading a Bible. We've got gift Bibles as you leave this morning. I want to encourage you, take one of those Bibles if you don't have one. Begin reading in the Gospel of John. And let somebody know that you made this decision today. Because it's all about who you and I are connected to as we're coming into 2013 that will determine how our year ends and where we go in 2000. And how many of you know that God is on the move? If you believe God's on the move and you want to be right in the middle of what he's doing, I want you to stand with me this morning. We are going to close in a word of prayer and in song and... Uh, we want you to, to go with a song in your heart, better than when you came. And as we close in uh, prayer and song, as, as the song begins to play, if you need someone to just grab hands with you and pray, and I'd like to ask some of our prayer partners and our leaders to come and just stand across the front here, you know, just come up to the altar and someone will pray with you. Father, thank you for this incredible day, this great day of celebration, Lord for enriching our hearts, Father. As we leave, we thank you, God, that your ministering angels watch over us, keep us in all of our ways of service and obedience. We dedicate our week for your glory. In Christ's name we pray, amen. God bless you. Have an awesome week.